Horizon Academy first annual retreat and this is an opportunity that we really recap the year and really set the course uh, for next year so as you know Mark Johnson he's running a little late today but we were able to get a inmate that's going to speak on his behalf and we're going to introduce you to him at this time his name is Jason Smith and he's all the way from Pinellas Correctional Institution. Hello, my name is Jason Smith and one of my reasons for being here today is I understand that you all work with kids at an alternative school. And uh, as an adult, uh, I kind of share my story because I kind of grew up in alternative schools, which is part of where I am right now. So my intention today is to just kind of share with you all my story from my perspective of how either I guess it, it worked or it didn't work. But uh, I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. That's my home of origin. Um, I'm the, uh, the youngest of four. My daddy wasn't there. Um, Mama raised us to the best of her ability. Um, and, and starting out with my, with my life, I had a pretty good childhood for the most part, and I grew up in the inner city. You know, but the problem with me centered around not having good mentors to help direct my life. And, and because of that, when I was in the mainstream school, uh, I didn't apply myself. Mama was too busy working her jobs, because she had three different jobs. You know, so therefore, you know, she depends on the babysitter, but we play around the babysitter and manipulate the situation where we just did what we wanted to do. My grandparents, they tried to, they tried to raise us, but we were just too much for them. So we just kind of just, you know, hung under the umbrella of mom and kind of raising ourselves. You know, but it's something I've learned since my incarceration and now that I'm I'm doing the community service thing is that, you know, it starts early in, in, in elementary school. And some of the guys and I, when we sit back and we talk about, you know, what's happening in society today and even with the guys inside the institution, we all kind of come to the conclusion that it starts early and if there is no prevention then it all becomes intervention. And intervention is my being locked up. Or in my case as a young kid, being kicked out of mainstream school and placed in the alternative school. There are a lot of kids who have grown up like me. And I got this poem I want to read for you all um, that kind of describes them, and I'm sure you'll you'll identify with it as I read it. So please just, just listen to the poem and see the face of the kids that you all are responsible for. It's called Hanging Out. I remember being 16 without a care in the world, hanging out with my homies trying to impress my favorite girl. 
Living life at a fast pace with my crew by my side. Making fast money, getting high, and not being afraid to die. Mom and dad always worried about me, but what do they know? I know the answer to it all. If they don't like it, they can go. People tell me, slow down to get my life straight. I'm making crazy money. I'm living a life that's great. My nightmare begins during a regular school night, hanging out with my crew, getting high as a kite. I got a bag of weed and some crack from my boy Sly with promises of riches, fast women, and cool rides. I was feeling like a man not far after that, with a wad of green in my pocket, my fly ride, and my gat. When I turned around the corner, my whole life was turned around. I had a muzzle to my head and my body pinned to the ground. Flashing lights all around, loud sirens and crying mothers. I'm getting busted like a punk. Why me and not those others? I'm just a young punk thinking I'm a man. I'm heading to the big house. I'm heading to the can. I ain't going to sweat this. I'm just a minor child. But when the judge dishes me, I go bug wild. I'm a man, I tell the judge, not a punk, you see. So as a man, the judge sentences me to the year 2053. Now my homies are living large, and I'm on my way to the pen. They don't give a damn about me. They don't even want to see me again. My first day in, I'm stripped of my pride and my clothes. I'm probed by the goon squad from my butt to my nose. My pride is shot. Reality is setting in, you see. What is this that's happening? I want my mommy to save me. I'm just a kid, I tell the boss, with tears in my eyes. He tells me, shut up, you punk, and face up to those guys. Those guys are lifers, killers, and G's. But who the hell am I? I'm just a punk wannabe. As I walk down the range, they call out, you sissy and fag. They stop. They say they're going to rape me and dress me in drag. Now I'm really scared. And I say a prayer above. Why did I pick the street punks and not the family that I love? I remember the tears in my family's eyes, my father's broken heart, and my mother's desperate cries. Why my baby? She yelled from the back of the room. The judge ordered her out. My mommy's gone. For sure I'm doomed. They put me in a cold cell with a monster named Jim. He tells me I'm his woman and to start servicing him. I wish I knew back then what I know now. I swear to you, I'd hang out with a different crowd. Being myself is easier than trying to be cool. Growing up in the fast lane to be someone else's fool. They treat me like dirt, sell me for a pack of smokes. I'm their woman, their slave. I'm a wannabe joke. After being raped, stabbed, and almost killed, I'm sitting in solitary where everything is chill. I have my own bed, and I sleep good at night without the need for crying, just a daily sense of fright. I wanted to live in the fast lane with riches, women, and dope. So now I'm hanging out with my neck tied to a rope. They call it suicide, you see. I call it an easy escape from a world so disgusting, full of anger and hate. So now I'm hanging out in the comfort of my cell. Lord, please take me to heaven. I've already been to hell. 
It doesn't matter the color or ethnicity. You got black, white, Hispanic, Vietnamese. We, you got people, children who are lost. I remember when I was in school, I could tell who really cared and who really didn't. Just like an animal knows when you're scared of it, so do children, men in prison, adults. Those who pay attention know who really care and who really don't. I ask the question sometimes, are they dream keepers or jail keepers? I felt like they were jail keepers because really many of them didn't want to be there in the first place. They didn't volunteer to come to the schools I was in. And I could tell by their attitude that they wanted to leave. And because of that, they empowered me and those like me. Because see, it's easy to empower a child when they know you're not real. I, do, you, do you have any water? But my lips kind of dry right now, sir. Can I don't have it. But uh, see, I've been out before, and we've talked about this. Now I just, I just need some turn water. Around, turn around. I just need some turn water. Around, turn around. See, I just, just give me. Right, all right, all right. All right, all right, all right. Okay, all right, all right. Okay, all right, all right, all right. Oh, we good? Turn up, turn up, we good? Turn we good? Turn up, turn up. All right, we good? We good? All right. Okay, no, I'm not in, mate. Sit down. It's all good, y'all. It's, it's all good. It's all good. Okay. All right. Tempo. It's all right. It's, all, it's okay. You all can breathe. Please. Breathe. This is just a ruse. This is just a dramatization, okay? All right? Okay? All right? Okay? All right. Calm down. Thank you all. Appreciate it, Sergeant John. Mr. Jenkins, thank you. Now, how many of you all about ready to hit me with a shoe? Or who, who, who was ready to run? <laughs> you can't run. Oh, my God. Well, it's a pleasure for me to be here today. Um, my name is Mark Johnson. And I met Mr. Omar Bradley probably around 2006. I retired from the Department of Justice, the Federal Bureau of Prisons, in 2012. And Omar was referred to me by someone at a Rotary event where I spoke to the youth. And forgive me for getting this stuff out of the way, you are. And the first time, he wasn't at Louise Johnson Middle School at that time. At that time, he was at Central High. I don't know how they talk with gold grills in their mouth. <laughs> I mean, really. And you all don't know how hard it was for me to find this gold grill in order to facilitate this, this dramatization. But the first time I met him, I decided that I would visit his school. And I was very impressed with the school that he principled. I was also sad by the obituaries on his wall of the students who had been killed also. He had subsequently gotten promoted and he went to the Louise Johnson Middle School, which is an international baccalaureate arts school, and that was my first time even understanding or knowing what an IB school was. And it was at that time that he asked me if I would come down and speak to his youth. He said, Johnson, during the daytime, they're like angels, but at night, they're like devils. They're off the chain. So I tried to figure out, how do I come up with some type of catch, some type of hook that can get their attention for the first three to five minutes? If I can capture their attention or their interest in the first three to five minutes that I have them, I cannot sing. I don't juggle toilet paper, chainsaws, or apples. I don't do that snap, crackle, pop, dance, and stuff that they do. And I'm not a stand-up comedian. Sure. 
I'm not a stand-up comedian. The only thing I know is this, is that for 12 years, I was in the military. And following my time in the military, I started working for the Department of Justice in 1990, 1991. I worked at the United States Disciplinary Barracks in Leavenworth, Kansas. Do we have a napkin or something? Uh, forgive me. I thought I had a little wipey or something here to catch the sweat. All that activity causes you to sweat. I'm good, Omar. So in 1991, I was 37 years old. Uh, I didn't get promoted to major. I was passed over. I later found out I had PTSD. Had no clue, no idea that I had post-traumatic stress syndrome, which adversely impacted my getting promoted. I didn't find this out until later on. So at the age of 37, the cutoff for working with the Department of Justice, I had to make a decision. I was a single parent at the time. I wanted to be an air marshal. But I couldn't be an air marshal because I was a father. I had just taken custody of my son. So right next to the disciplinary barracks there in Leavenworth, Kansas, was the federal penitentiary, Leavenworth. So I went over, I interviewed, and I was picked up as a correctional officer, even though I had a master's in human resource development with a bachelor's in criminal justice and a minor in psychology. That was the only way I could get into the system very quickly. So from that time all the way up until now, that's all I know or knew. So when he asked me to come and speak, I said, this is what I'll do. I'll dress up like an inmate. Because I was the hostage negotiation team leader. And for those of you all who don't know, the largest federal prison in the United States of America is in a little town called Coleman, Florida, which is close to Wildwood or Okahumpka, if any of you all know where they are. We have five federal prisons there. And I was the hostage negotiation team leader. So I came up with this idea that I will create this avatar. So I go down to the school. The resource officers, they escorted me in like I did with you all. I had my gold grill in my mouth at the time. They escort me into the gymnasium. And I'm going in there all bad. And they were talking up in the bleachers. And I said, you all better be quiet before I go off like King Kong up in here. That was from training days with Denzel Washington. I remember that. <laughs> and they got quiet. They got quiet. So then I began to go into my mean man role, and my gold grill pops out of my mouth. <laughs> right there on the floor. And, you know, I'm a Toastmaster. And that would have been a great table topic or an impromptu, and I had no comeback for that. So I had to just strip everything away and just go straight into my presentation. But... When Omar asked me today to speak with you all, I felt it was very appropriate because I had been here before when Coach D was here and he was giving a presentation. And when he told me that he was gonna, going to have a retreat and he liked to open with a keynote, something happened that day that sparked the topic of my presentation to you all today. There was a young man, it was the middle school kids, middle school boys in there at the time. There was a young man who kept getting up and walking around in the cafeteria. He would walk over here, stand, he would sit down and he would get up and walk to the other corner. And he was really a distraction. And I'm asking myself, why is he doing that? So Coach D, he continued not being distracted by his distraction. After the presentation was over, the students left. No, before the students left, Sergeant Jones came into the room right, right before it ended and said, come here. He took the young man out. I thought there was a family emergency. I thought something had happened. And the young man was just fidgety because of that. After everyone had left, Sergeant Jones then came back into the cafeteria and he asked one question. Why didn't anyone stop that young man from being a distraction? I thought that was a very epic question. Very salient and very poignant. 
Why? Why didn't anyone? There were four teachers in there, I counted, if I recall correctly. And no one did anything. And I began to ask myself the question, well, why not? Is it because they were scared? Now, you all have to understand, I'm an outsider looking in. I've dealt with disruptive behavior all my life. Before I retired, I retired from the penitentiary. I worked at every institution there. So I understand about disruption, conflict resolution, de-escalation, all these things. I understand that. But I asked the question, why didn't anyone do anything? And I said, Omar, I really would like to talk to that. So if I had to give this keynote a topic, I would use the word purpose as my topic. Purpose. Because it is in our purpose that we move, we exist, that we make a difference. I had an experience that made me the man I am today because I'm one of the most highly purposeful individuals you'll meet. My passion becomes so strong that I am talking in front of a group of people, I begin to froth at the mouth. And sometimes I'll spray on someone and have to apologize because I'm so wound up in what I'm trying to share. We're in Yazoo City, Mississippi, my son and I. I didn't know Yazoo City, Mississippi even existed until I got a promotion and ended up there. It is certainly not the type of place I would have really wanted to live. The ground was hard. It was clay, always hard. And the mosquitoes in abundance. And there was always that mist on your skin that I always experienced. One day, an old gentleman came by my house, knocked on the door, Mr. Arthur Claiborne. He was 89 years old, a retired postal worker. And he asked me, Mark Johnson, how would you like to go to the local jail and teach Sunday school? Now, Yazoo City is condensed. Everything is right there. The prison I worked at was only a half a mile away, the federal prison. The church I attended was a block over. The jail, three blocks down the street. Me being the helpful individual I am, the purposeful individual I am, I said, sure, I like to teach Sunday school. And this is a true story that I'm sharing with you all because it helped fuel what I am today. It was a nasty jail. Nasty. Imagine traveling. You stop at a 7-Eleven off the interstate. You go into the bathroom for your pit stop. But once you step into that bathroom, the floor, the sink, the toilet, and the basin, everything has what appears to be chocolate milk, which is hard water stains. So I presume none of you all would use that type of bathroom. You'd probably clam up, back out, and get back on the interstate until you get off at the next exit. That's how nasty this jail was. I would look at the men, black, white, Hispanic, young and old, and at this point, I had been there several Sundays, because what we would do, we would teach Sunday school, then we would go to our own church and worship afterwards. So it wasn't just teaching Sunday school, but it was also a form of mentoring. And I always ask myself the question, why do these young men and old men get released and then come back here? I could never understand that. So one day, I'm having a conversation with one of the inmates standing right in front of him, a young man. And as I'm talking to him, I experience, some would call it an out-of-body experience, clairvoyance. I, my spirit travels. Some people, they're laying on their deathbed or in the emergency room, and their spirit rises to the ceiling. They look down and see their body. Something similar to that 
The only thing I knew was this. I was no longer in front of that young man, and I was in Rwanda. I was there looking at the bodies floating down the river, because I remember it on television around 1981. Over a million people, men, women, and children, massacred by their own color simply because of ethnic differences. And I remembered watching that and being hurt by what I saw. Then my mind shifted from there to Sarajevo, where over 10,500 men, women, and children disappeared. I then shifted to the Middle East, understanding the devastation and the death experienced there. And then my mind came back to the United States. And I'm thinking about the gang violence that's taking place in the communities because of some demarcation line or the name of a sign on the street they're killing each other and if you were to question why you're doing this and understand the ethos of why they really can't tell you because there is no reason they're killing their own kind because somewhere in that DNA strand that genetic link they are connected and as I stood there, and all of this is happening in, in lightning, lightning speed, I then remember when I was young and I went to a planetarium. How many of you all know what a planetarium is? Raise your hand. I figured educators would. Most people don't. Never been. I remember when I went there and I would lean back in the seat and I would look up at the ceiling that's pitch black. And then they would throw the stars in there. And then they would pull the planet Earth out, this green blue planet rotating on its axis. And I thought about it and I said, on this little sphere within it, we have the ability for no one to be hungry, no one to be without health care, everyone can have a roof, everyone can be okay. And then I began to cry. And the young man shook my shoulders. And he said, Mr. Johnson, are you okay? And I said, no, I'm not okay. I said, this is too big for me. This is too much. I guess sometimes you all may feel like that working in a school where the children don't care. I could probably understand why you would sometimes feel overwhelmed. Today, I saw the same little girl who the female sheriff put down when I was here. They took her out today. And I had a very long conversation with her last time I was here. Experientially, we were in the classroom and I was doing the exercise with her. So I can understand your sense of being, over, being overcome by children whose parents have no interest, whose parents are not external stakeholders in what's going on as far as their own children's educational process. But as I stood there with him, I began to cry and I said, this is too much for me. I can't handle it because I'm kind of Pollyanna in nature. I kind of have this nirvana, utopian mindset that we all can just be okay. But that's not true. And at that time, there was a faint whisper that emanated deep from within me. And this is what the whisper said. Shh. Shh. You may not be able to change the world but you can impact those in the space that you occupy. And I heard that whisper one more time. You may not be able to change the world, but you can impact those in the space that you occupy. And at that time, I felt so much better because I realized that I don't have to save the world. But if I only make a difference, 
And if I only affect one, Mother Teresa said, if you can't feed 100, then just feed one. And if you can't touch 100, then that one that you have touched is the one that you were meant to touch. And when that voice resonated in my mind, I saw the face of Mother Teresa, Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, and the representation of Jesus Christ, which people get really focused on the, the physical expression. You know, blue-eyed, tears, sad, you know, he's black, dreadlocks, but it's not even about that. It's about the essence of the individual and what the individual's purpose in life was. That's what it's about. I saw those five individuals, and from that point on, I was challenged to do the best that I possibly could. Fast forward, I now become a life coach. I go out to California to become a dream coach. One week there, the first day there, there's 160 some odd people there going through this certification, many of them from around the world. One question was asked, what is your purpose? I'm 56. I'll be 57 in August. I was 50 then, and I had no idea how to answer that question. And I thought I knew a lot. But what helped me was I read Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life. Not only did I read the book, I became a Celebrate Recovery facilitator. I did the 40 days of purpose inside of my home. I did the 40 days of community where our group identified some agency or entity that needed assistance like painting or whatever. So I understood purpose. And I remember Rick Warren saying our first purpose is to worship God or whatever you all know God to be. But our second purpose is to understand what it is that we're supposed to be doing here on this earth. So my question to you all today, if I was to ask you all, what is your purpose? What is your personal purpose statement? Because we understand that a person without a purpose is a purpose without an intention. And if you have no intention, you have no meaning for life. We had to develop our own personal purpose statement. And mine was to inspire, impact, empower and help transform those in or out of the space that I occupy. That became mine. How many of you all volunteered to be teachers at Horizon? Raise your hands. Hi. Wow. I'm surprised. You can put it down, honey. Yes. I said, you're like, you really, you, you in there. <laughs> That's noteworthy. Because when I thought of asking that question, I didn't think I was going to see many hands go up. I'm going to be honest. Because not everyone is cut out for this type of work. This takes a very special person to do what you all do. Everyone can't do it. Just like everyone can't work inside of a federal prison, in a penitentiary. You all are cut of some special DNA or brand strain that allows you all to do what you all do. Because if you weren't purposeful, if you all were not passionate about what you do, I don't think you would still be here. You would just flat out quit. Yes, you must eat, you must pay for your gas, and you must have transportation, but sometimes it gets to a point that if this is not really what you want to do, then the best thing to do is to find something else. And why would I say that? Because the children in those classrooms know when you care and when you don't care. They know. You empower those children when you do not hold them accountable when they step out of line. 
like that young boy that got up that day, and I'm not, I'm not trying to bang anyone here or anything like that. I'm an outsider looking in. I wanted to get up out of my chair and put him against the wall. It's like, man, you need to stop this. What, why? But see, nothing being done only empowers that type of child. You have resources, I understand, because that's the first question that I asked. What do they have at their disposal to handle a child like that? Radios, you all have a level system, you all got the cavalry, which is the staff, you got Sergeant Jones and the other sergeant, so you all have all the tools you all need in order to keep these disruptive children who are lost in their place. So the question is, are you on board 100% or are you not? In Fort Benning, Georgia, they have an infantry statue there, a bronze statue with the infantry soldier leaning forward with an M16 with a fixed bayonet. And the inscription at the bottom of that statue is literally, is this, I, I, I quote it verbatim, Lead, follow, or get the hell out of the way. Literally, that's at the bottom of that inscription. Lead, follow, or get the hell out of the way. And within that is pregnant so much power. You all here are change agents. You are. I applaud you all because 70 students were sent back to mainstream school from Horizon. 70 students. That's noteworthy. Y'all give yourself a hand for that, please. Clap, please. Thank you. That's noteworthy because that means that you all made a difference in the lives of these children. So in ending this keynote, because we're about to transition now into your breakout sessions, I just want to encourage you all and to think about this, particularly when you're talking to the kids. Ask them, what's your dream? Do you have a dream? What is your purpose? Do you understand what a purpose is? All of it's connected to passion. Whatever they're passionate about. Taisha or whatever that big old girl name that they took to jail. I asked her at the table, what is it that you're passionate about doing? And she said, I like hair. I would like to be a cosmetologist. But you know what else she said at that time? She then said, but I have to stop getting in trouble. I have to stop getting locked up. I said, Taisha, are you a bully? She said, yes. I said, why are you a bully? She said, because others bully me. But you're bigger than most of the kids. Do you bully kids who don't do anything to you? She said, yes. I said, Taisha, do me a favor. And we did the little fist thing. I said, try to say something nice to someone. But see, if she's not taking her medication, which is not you all's fault, then she's going to do what happened that day when I saw the blinds in the cafeteria rustling and I ran over there and the female sergeant had her down on the floor with her knee in her back. Just try not to lose sight. Do not be discouraged. You all are handling children whose parents, many of them don't care. But you all have to look beyond that. This character that I, I gave you all, he could easily be someone who was in an alternative school. And maybe only one person could have changed his whole behavior, which would result in a different outcome. So with that being said, anyone have any questions? Because that is the end of, quote, the keynote portion of this before you all break into your breakout groups and look at some of the other purposeful stuff regarding Horizon Academy. <laughs>